Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Calvin Sharps and I'm the VP of Marketing at Pixelate. And I'm gonna be your moderator today. Pixelate is a leading provider of ad fraud monitoring and market compliance solutions. And today we're gonna to be presenting the Publisher Trust Index Methodology Overview with Pixelate's data science team. But first, a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into your question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. We will answer as many of these questions at the end of the webinar as possible. If we don't have time to answer your questions, we will respond directly to you in the next day or so. So without further ado, let's do a quick introduction of the panelists. Again, my name is Calvin Sharps. I am VP of Product Marketing, and I'm a dedicated ad tech and MarTech technology executive and I have over 20 years of experience managing products, marketing operations, and sales. My experience ranges from working from Fortune 500 companies to small startups. Hi everyone, my name is Anzus Lazarus and I'm the Chief Data Scientist at Pixelate. I oversee the development of Pixelate's invalid traffic detection and prevention platforms uh, and also various uh, rating frameworks behind Pixelate Media Rating Terminal. I have extensive academic experience uh, working in network traffic modeling, and also I have a PhD in electrical engineering. Hey everyone, my name is Melvin James Bogut. Um, I am the data scientist at Pixelit. I have developed the publisher Trust Index and also uh, helped develop various machine learning algorithms as well as like various estimates, uh, estimated metrics that have been used in the Pixelit media rating terminal. Um, I have a master's degree in data science from UC Berkeley. Thanks, everyone. Um, just a quick introduction about Pixelate. Pixelate, again, is an ad fraud monitoring and marketing compliance platform. We are MRC accredited for ad fraud detection across CTV, mobile, in-app, and desktop mobile web. We offer several products, including pre-bid blocking, analytics, and a media radiance terminal for supply chain management and programmatic. And we often publish and uh, do research and education for the industry in our blog, so I encourage you to subscribe if you get a chance. <clears throat> so Pixelate has pioneered the concept of quality ratings for quite a while, uh, since 2014 in digital advertising. And we first introduced the Global Sellers Trust Index, which rates the overall quality of traffic delivered by SSPs. Our new Global Publisher Trust Index brings the same concept to our publishers. While the Global Seller Trust Index rankings offer a transparent look at the pipes that buyers go through to access ad inventory, we know there's a thirst for even more granular insight for advertisers deserve full transparency into what they are buying. And the publishers deserve to know how they stack up against the competition. We believe that gone are the days of quality or quantity as a measurement for buyers that are looking for, but they would want to look for quality. We give publishers the ability to manage their quality in one and trust in one platform. So Pixelate Insights scroll across a variety of different things. We have publisher ratings, supply chain ratings, IoT device ratings, compliance and privacy risks, brand protection, ad fraud, monetization, and regulatory compliance. All of these insights are, are spread across our media ratings terminal. But we also have had some great validations for the new publisher trust index. Here's a partner of ours, such as Zumo, that has uh, said that introducing the, the Pixelate trust index is a truly a game changer in the industry. Uh, so uh, before we begin talking about the publisher indexes, let's talk a little bit about the data behind. Uh, so in order to produce the publisher trust indexes, we analyze data from more than 5 million apps, mobile apps for Android and iOS, and more than 40,000 connected TV apps. Uh, we produce uh, more than 200 distinct uh, publisher indexes for various slices of uh, IAB categories, specifically more than 35 IAB categories were used across uh, four broad geographical regions. In order to do all this, we had to process more than 2 trillion distinct data points. Hey, Mel, when you're on mute. <clears throat> uh, just to follow on what Agilus mentioned, um, 
the publisher trust index basically um, ranks apps on uh, for mobile and ctv for mobile obviously the two main platforms are ios and android for ctv currently we rank apps uh, or publishers for roku and fire tv which are arguably the top um, programmatic platforms right now uh, so uh, um, the four main regions that we rank across uh, are uh, North America, EMEA, Asia Pacific, and Latin America. So without further ado, let's actually get into the methodology for the Publisher Trust Index, and we'll have Agalos and Melwin uh, go and explain the differences between CTV and mobile apps and how we're rating and ranking those folks. So the first uh, publisher index we'll be talking about is the Connected TV or CTV publisher index. So the index uh, uses four main metrics uh, to rank publishers. Specifically, we use the popularity score, invalid traffic score, ad density score, and user engagement score. All these metrics will be defined in uh, the next slides, uh, but what we need to know for now is that they correspond to uh, a number essentially uh, that ranges from 0 to 99. They get normalized essentially, and at the very end, they're combined into a final score using a non-linear framework, which we also describe. The main idea here is that we want to go beyond traditional weighted averages because these models suffer in terms of their scalability and correctness when it comes to ranking too many publishers. So the first metric uh, that we look at is a popularity score. So popularity score is an important metric because it gives you an estimate of how popular this publisher is in a programmatic sense, right? As well as it gives you a general estimate of the programmatic inventory for that publisher, right? Uh, it is an actually a very important metric for the ranking itself, uh, for the PTI itself, um, uh, and the Popularity score is uh, actually a combinatory score, which takes into account various signals such as uh, the estimated MA or the monthly act, uh, average users, uh, the impressions, the number of uh, reviews, the downloads. Like it takes all these um, signals, right, whatever is available, and tries to estimate a programmatic uh, popularity score for that. Uh, one thing to note here is um, the score is comparative in nature. So basically it compares each publisher against e every other publisher in the geo or geography and category. And what this helps is it helps remove any differences in ge geography or category and helps rank uh, apps among themselves. Another very important metric we use to rank publishers is the percentage of invalid traffic. This is often used uh, or called ad fraud, but in reality, uh, ad fraud is only a portion of invalid traffic, and that's what the definition we use here. So like the other metrics that characterize publishers, uh, here we also have a, a relativistic component in the IBT, which means that we, uh, we grade uh, you know, IBT uh, for publishers across different categories and geography, and we can produce a ranking even if the IBT, let's say, is relatively higher for certain geographies. However, uh, apps or uh, essentially publishers in general with very high IBT or publishers that have been blocked for certain violations are expected to get very low scores in this category. Um, also, the higher the IBT for a given publisher, the higher the contribution will be into its final score, which is also an example of non-linear grading that is mandatory here in order to avoid cases, let's say, of a publisher having very high IBT uh, which means very low score, but they get very high scores in every other category and thus they can rank very high. So clearly that's an, an edge case we want to be taking into account. A, another very important metric that we uh, developed for, for Connected TV Trust Indexes is the ad density. Uh, ad density is defined as the frequency that video ads uh, appear uh, over a period of 10 minutes. We uh, essentially uh, found that 10 minutes is a good value for capturing this type of information because it gives a good balance between session duration and also, uh, you know, what uh, I, 
frequency, the, the, the essentially the duration of the ad breaks that uh, appear very frequently for premium publishers. So the question here that might arise is why is this metric important? So knowing the number of ads uh, for a given publisher can give information, let's say, about finding revenue opportunities or estimating how competitive a publisher can be, or even finding publishers that have very high density that can lead to low engagement. However, the important thing to understand here is that ad density is really a trade-off, which means that uh, it is needs to find a balance between uh, maximizing advertising revenue uh, and also minimizing user disturbance or maximizing user experience. So clearly we have two uh, conflicting objectives. The financial or the advertising world would like to have more ads being shown, but the users would like to have less ads being shown. And what we try to do here is find a balance between the two. So <clears throat> our approach was data driven. So what we ended up using doing is uh, we analyzed uh, a set of premium publishers as well as uh, a set of smaller publishers. And we try to understand what is the values of the density they use and also what is the resulting user experience and that we combine it also with impression level data about you know the scale of an app the, the engagement the session durations and so on and so forth so we created an empirical distribution or a, a not density grading curve which is what we show here where you can see that the best the highest scores are achieved for densities between three and five uh, also smaller scores are achieved uh, you know are assigned for densities less than two and more than six, and the smallest scores are assigned for this is more than eight. And obviously this aligns with the intuition that publishers with very high densities should not get the high score because it affects user engagement. So another important metric you look at is user engagement. Uh, this is an important metric in the CTV space, especially because it gives um it basically helps estimate uh, the opportunity to monetize on ads for that publisher right so uh, we look at the average or the time spent by an average user con uh, consuming content for that for a publisher or for an app right uh, we estimate this by looking at the ivt free minutes um, uh, that an average user spends in a given session as well as the number of sessions a user or like a typical user has right and uh, basically a session is one sitting of an or one continuous viewing of the app right for example if you're viewing hulu for like an hour and then that's one session and after you switch off and you come back after say two hours that's another another session right so we basically take in those into account um, this again is a comparative score where every publisher is compared against or uh, you know uh, compared against every other publisher in the geo and category so that gave you an overall idea of what the ctv indexes are so now we can move on to the mobile app uh, trust indexes where here the difference compared to ctvs that we had to create millions of publishers because the you know obviously the mobile ecosystem is much big, bigger right now so that created some additional challenges because we had to add to introduce additional data points that are specialized for mobile uh, so we ended up using uh, the popularity score uh, invalid traffic score the apps txt score the brand safety score app permission score uh, which is currently available for android and also the viewability score so similarly to the case of CTV, all these metrics uh, are converted to a number between 0 and 99. And then we uh, use a nonlinear framework in order to produce a final score that combines all these things together. And of course, the ranking can follow after that. Um, so in the next slides, uh, we will be deep diving into the metrics that are unique to mobile that haven't covered uh, for the case of CTV, because the remaining essential, they follow the same guidelines, the same principles. So a method that is uh, unique to uh, mobile, and there is a main reason for that, is the Apache TXT. Uh, the reason here is that uh, for CTV, uh, Apache TXT is a relatively new thing, and we cannot expect publishers to have deployed something that's really being developed right now. 
So, however, in mobile, it's pretty prevalent, and now absence of Apache TXT can be a strong signal of uh, low quality. So, motivated by this observation, we produced uh, an Apache TXT score that is a composite score that combines information about, first of all, the presence of the Apache TXT file, as well as the type of entries that it includes in terms of sellers and resellers. So our, our research here essentially validates the well-known industry belief that the number of entries in the file uh, and the type of entries like sellers and resellers can also give you information about the likelihood for a given publisher to conduct IVT. Even if it's currently not being done, it can be an avenue for doing IVT in the future. Um, so especially as the number of entries, it gets larger and larger. larger. Uh, another thing to keep in mind here is that entries in an RTXT file don't have to all be active at any given time. Uh, so we expect that we have a you know well designed and cleaned up uh, you know RTXT file, and we don't want cases of you know the bad publishers to uh, to leverage bad sellers later on in the future. So there is this notion of capturing IBT risk uh, using this metric. It's a very important metric. So what we did here to develop a score is we used a, uh, a non-linear uh, framework as well, and we grouped publishers together, we're essentially forming clusters, and we group them based on their IVT, uh, overall IVT uh, behavior. So we studied very well the, the characteristics of the ads.txt files of the publishers that had low IVT over a long period of time, so we knew that they don't, you know, game, let's say, the system for a small period of time and then behave bad later. And we found out that there is a certain characteristic, there's a, cert a certain, you know, pattern that good publishers follow. And based on that, we developed a grading framework for uh, Apache TXT. So based on that, we are able to uh, create a score that assigns uh, the highest scores in the publishers that have uh, you know, the, the best, the healthiest mix of sellers and resellers and behave good overall. And it's important to note here also that this doesn't aim to overlap or capture IVT today. It can capture IVT risk and quality risk over a long period of time over the future in case the publisher, you know, um, leverages, you know, connections with sellers in the future. Uh, so brand safety. Um... So when it comes to brand safety, I'm sure for this audience, we like I don't need to specify why brand safety is important when it comes to quality, right? Uh, so brand safety basically protects uh, brand reputation and helps um, advertisers avoid placing ads in front of inappropriate content, right? So the pub, uh, the brand safety score in the Publisher Trust Index. Uh, aims to capture apps with increased likelihood of uh, adult content, drug, violence, alcohol, hate speech, or gambling, gambling content. Um, and the way uh, the Publisher Trust Index does that is looking at, um, number one, the primary signal that they look at is the app advisories or the content ratings, which are specified in their respective like app stores, right, or like iOS, iTunes store, or the Google Play store. Um, and in top, on top of that, we also look at uh, various other signals like the title, the description, um, um, uh, the keywords, anything that can indicate that this this publisher can be brand unsafe. Uh, yeah. So another important metric that we found it very informative for assessing publishers is uh, what we call permission score. So what is the main idea behind permission? So as you might know, um, uh, permission is essentially uh, uh, an action that an app uh, requests access to uh, certain resources from the operating system of a given app. And usually that requires you know, user permission to, to, to grant the access. So um, certain permissions, let's say uh, accessing location information, might be, uh, you know, they have a privacy and compliance component because the data can be very sensitive. So clearly, uh, we, we want to study that very carefully and assess the apps based on this uh, compliance and how they approach permissions. Um, one important thing to note here is that uh, there is a category of permissions that are very typical and they appear they are necessary for a given app to operate. 
And these are, you know, they're perfectly fine. Like for example, location information uh, is mandatory for navigation apps. Usually permissions are, you know, clustered and classified um, uh, by category, which means that they are very common within a given category. All the apps or most of the apps will usually have these permissions. However, we saw that there is another category of permissions that we call a typical, which essentially they're not necessary for the app to operate. And they are a product of over permissioning, essentially like the app might request uh, 20 permissions, or, although in reality it might need only 10. Now, what we do uh, here is we study the behavior and the permissions given to various apps within a given category, and we focus on the ones that uh, are uh, associated with higher likelihood of producing IBT. So to do so, we study the apps that have high IBT within a given category, and we see if we check if they have unlikely and un infrequent permissions that are not necessary for the category. Uh, and based on that, we detect correlations with high IBT. So it's important to note here that we don't detect causal relationships. We don't detect a permission that 100% now causes IBT to happen. But this is a risk area where a permission can be used in the future for malicious activity. Or we, or we have seen that uh, whenever we see a certain permission, that really means a uh, higher likelihood of IBT. So that's the main idea here. So over permission is something we want to really limit and assign a good, a better score to apps that don't uh, over permission themselves, essentially. So viewability is uh, also another um, another very important metric that we look at. Uh, so viewability basically is important because it kind of tells you the efficacy of your ad, ad spent dollars. Uh, viewability is basically uh, the percentage of impressions which are viewable to the user. Um, uh, so uh, Pixlet relies on impression data to basically determine this or to just estimate this uh, data point. It assigns scores based on the viewability for each and every uh, given publisher and is comparative. Uh, also, just to note that um, we calculate we calculate viewability after re uh, removing the IBT impressions, and this is as per the MRC guideline for viewability measurement. Yes, thank you, um, Agalos and Melwin. That was uh, very informative. Um, again, folks, if you have questions, um, please put that in the questions and we'll answer those at the end of, of the session here. Um, we also have a lot of people that ask about the data collection and our methodologies around that for the Publisher Trust Index. So we'll spend the next few minutes going through the examples and how we do that. And I'll turn the time back over to Agalos and Melwin. Uh, thanks, Calvin. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the data collection and pre-processing, which is essentially the, the first uh, stage of, uh, you know, that produces the data that go to the indexes. Uh, so the data collection and pre-processing uh, consists of four main steps. Uh, the first step is what we call data deduplication. Uh, essentially, in this step, what we do is we try to find impressions that have been monitored across the ecosystem uh, from multiple observation points. Like for example, you might see an impression at the SSP level and also you might be integrated with the DSP and see the same user twice. So clearly that can cause uh, issues. So we wanna deduplicate the data. Um, so we do that across all the sources using various uh, user identification methods that go beyond just standard you know, device information and stuff like that. Um, and after we do uh, the deduplication, we follow a biased eliminations uh, essentially process. Um, so this is step number two. And this is very, very important because when you try to run publishers, clearly you don't want any uh, either sampling bias or selection bias to be introduced. What this uh, really means is that you might have, let's say, a source that sends you more, more impressions or more information about a given publisher than others, right? And that can make a publisher appear more transparent or more or better overall. Uh, another case that we want to capture here is uh, publishers that can appear cleaner or better because a certain vendor only focuses on the good inventory, which is an example of what, of what is called selection bias. So clearly, um, 
by looking at the data holistically and eliminating the sources and normalizing the data, we are able to balance things out and produce a more accurate picture about the published behavior. Uh, the third step is what we call data aggregation step. So here, the data, after they have been deduced and cleaned up and normalized, um, they are aggregated according to the you know, dimensions of interest. Like, for example, we can pivot data at the publisher or we can pivot data at the publisher category and uh, uh, the geographical region. And also, we can pivot data across you know, the board. So uh, that is also what produces these uh, various combinations of the indexes that we discussed earlier. And the main idea here is that we want to study publishers in different scales, right? We don't want to have one uh, big global view. Sometimes it's very important to focus on certain regions or on certain categories uh, because of the type of business that you are in or the, you know, the objective that you have. Um, the final step is the IVT processing. So here the main idea is that we want to uh, either enhance metrics with IVT information, if they, capture, if they capture IVT, we want to essentially maintain the IVT information, or if they need to be IVT free in order to be graded, like for example, viewability, we want to remove IVT um, per, you know, per the MRC, MRC requirements, because we're also an MRC accredited vendor for viewability. So we, we follow you know, the MRC standards there. Um, So after we do all this pre-processing, um, the, the next thing, obvious thing to do is to try to put things together and produce a meaningful ranking. Um, however, what we see here is that uh, ranking, you know, a diverse set of sellers, of uh, publishers, and also uh, uh, millions of publishers together is a non-obvious task. And traditional weighted average approach, weighted average approaches cannot scale well. Um, for example, uh, how can you rank, let's say, uh, a seller, uh, or, sorry, a, a publisher that has, let's say, 10% IVT, and how can you compare that with another publisher that has, uh, let's say, 20% IVT, if they have different size, right? If the one is small, one is big. All these comparisons can become even harder. Let's say if you if you want to have, let's say, a small publisher with almost zero IVT versus a premium publisher with maybe 5% IVT. So all this, especially breaking ties, is a, a challenge that is totally non-obvious. And this is something that weighted average approaches are not you know, built to, to resolve. Um, so uh, another example here that we can keep in mind is, uh, let's say we have a publisher that has 100% IVT. So a publisher with 100% IVT, if, they, if it gets good scores in other areas, it can still produce a good ranking and it can rank well compared to uh, publishers that have, let's say, smaller scale, but uh, zero IVT. Uh, so all these are extreme challenges. There are a lot of edge cases to take into account. So uh, we, you know, very early on, we saw that uh, weighted average models are completely out of the picture. Um, so what we started naturally doing later is we started uh, seeing uh, and analyzing the data and trying to find patterns. And we saw that uh, clustering the publishers together produces a meaningful grouping where things can be sorted out you know, more naturally. Like, for example, as individualization, you can see here, uh, publishers that are marked with the same color can have very similar IVT or viewability or, let's say, um, you know, magnitude, inventory, volume, and stuff like that. And sorting publishers and ranking publishers within a cluster, it can be a much more you know, easy and meaningful uh, and trivial task. So motivated by that, we developed a framework uh, that we will present in the next slide uh, that essentially it builds on top of this clustering idea. So the framework that we developed is called clustering-based generative nonlinear model. Uh, so it consists of six main stages. Uh, the first stage is the data pre-processing stage where we discussed it earlier. It, it has to do with all this deduplication, bias elimination, and so on and so forth. So after the data have been prepared, we are ready to essentially cluster them and analyze them together. So the second stage is the clustering stage. 
So here we, um, we, we did a lot of R&D and we tried to find a balanced set of clusters that can group similar, uh, you know, similar publishers together according to their behavior in the four dimension or six dimensional space. Uh, the four and the six come from the, you know, the number of uh, you know, uh, columns that we use or metrics that we use for ranking publishers for every index. Four is for CTV, six is for mobile. So after we do uh, this clustering, uh, we ended up using uh, 81 uh, clusters for this kind of uh, task that were able to separate all these uh, uh, patterns together very well and give us enough granularity and enough resolution. Um, so after that, essentially what we end up having is we have all the publishers grouped together and assigned in some cluster. Uh, the next step that follows is uh, step number three, uh, what we call inter-cluster ranking. This is the most important step of the whole algorithm because the idea here is that after you have grouped the publishers together, um, the question that arises is, okay, which group uh, is the more ideal or the more desirable, right? Or which group needs to go uh, before another group? So in order to answer to that question, we developed a proprietary distance metric that goes beyond the standard Euclidean distance metrics that have obviously issues in, uh, you know, in the, uh, in, when you try to measure distance in high dimensions. And we ended up essentially comparing the cluster centroids, uh, which means the most representative points within every cluster or the average, we can think about it as the, the average data point of a cluster the average publisher, we compare that uh, compared to the ideal publisher and see how far they are. And that process can give us a, can give us a natural ordering of the clusters where we know what is behaving better than the other, what is what needs to be ranked higher than the other. Uh, after we have completed that step, the next step is to step number four, is what we call intercluster scoring and ranking. And the main idea here is that we want to uh, produce rankings within every cluster, uh, which is a little bit more of a trivial task. And the main reason for that is because we compare apples to apples uh, within this cluster, because by definition, clustering finds these apples to apples uh, groupings in the data automatically. So it's important to understand here that the assignment is completely unsupervised, right? It's automated, so we don't tell every publisher where to go. Um, after we do that, we produce scores for every individual metric and we are able to sort the publishers within the cluster. Now, uh, the next step is to put step number three and four together and uh, essentially space things out and order and normalize the scores in a way that they follow the, the inter-cluster ranking uh, results that we found in, in step number three. So this way can produce essentially a global ranking that uh, we can use in order to block to, to, to rank uh, publishers that are diverse and that would be otherwise impossible. So another important thing to note here is that this uh, step, the score normalization happens also at various scales. Like for example, we, we do this for certain categories, IAB categories or for certain uh, geographical regions. And we are able to produce various slices of the data. Now, after the scores have been normalized and averaged out, we are producing uh, in step number six, the final ranking, which is uh, a simple ordering of the final score. Wow, that's a, that's a lot, Agalos. I, I was looking at multidimensional and I was trying to figure out what that meant, but well, we can ask that in the Q&A here in just a second. Um, but thank you very much, uh, Melwin and Agalos, for giving the explanation, not only for uh, the Publisher Trust Index methodology, but also for how the data collection, normalization, and, and how we look at it that um, in, in that regards. Um, a lot of publishers uh, come to us and ask, you know, how do I, how do I see my score? How do I uh, fix things that might be issues with that score? And so we have the ability for publishers, if you could want to log into our media ratings terminal, um, you can go into that through the rankings page. Um, you can create an account and you can see here, I'm sorry, it's very small, but there's a box that says, um, you know, request a publisher diagnostic report. Um, what we're doing here is we're opening up these scores to publishers 
for transparency in the in the ecosystem. A lot of people have um, you know have issues and they don't know why and they don't know how to solve those. So being able to request this report is the first step in doing that. It's kind of a, a coin to um, like HubSpot website grader or SEM Rush uh, allows you to do a website SEO grader. It's very similar to that. It'll give you kind of uh, things that you can look for um, to to help you kind of solve any any issues that you might have. So this open sourcing kind of the data of how you get it and the transparency is a key that we feel in the ecosystem to make it thrive and, and be more trusted and transparent and build, a, build more quality into the system. So please uh, take some time if you're interested um, and log into the system and request that report. It'll, it'll bring up a little form and then you'll be able to get that diagnostic report sent to you um, in, in kind of short order. Um, and uh, let's kind of dive in. We've, we've spent a lot of time with our, our clients and other folks uh, and, and talking about the Publisher Trust Index and uh, a lot of themes came up, which was, you know, trust and transparency, quality. We, we're, we talk a lot about that. Um, and, and this is uh, Francois from uh, Critio says the Pixelate reports bring transparency uh, to ad related quality issues. So we're really excited um, to partner with these types of folks um, and have their, you know, kind of feedback about what we're doing here. So we have several questions that we've asked. We've, uh, we'll try to keep, uh, we have about 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. We'll try to make it as quick as possible on these questions, but we do get quite a few questions here. Um, I will ask the questions and then I'll, I'll uh, make a suggestion on who, who can answer those. And then the rest of the panel can jump in um, if they have additional comments. But the first one that we have here uh, from someone is, what is the biggest challenge when building this out? And I'll throw that to, to you, Agalos, since you're the, the main architect on this, or the senior architect. Sure, uh, I think there were two main challenges uh, while trying to run publishers. The first one was what metrics to use and how many metrics to use. Um, and the second one was uh, what kind of framework uh, can you use to sort things out? So the first question, the first, uh, the first challenge essentially is when you want to rank publishers that are, let's say, at the scale of millions, how many dimensions is a good number to use, right? There are very classic data science problems, uh, like what is called the curse of dimensionality or other things that can arise if you try to put a lot of data points to, um, to rank publishers. Uh, the essence of it is that uh, when you add a lot of data points, uh, then the differences become very marginal, right? So, there, and also it's very hard to say who is doing better and how to measure distances uh, in, in such a high dimensional space. So we resolve that by trying to find the most informative uh, number of uh, metrics that we could use that fit a specific ecosystem like mobile or CTV uh, and that give, our, give enough information to separate publishers from each other. And they have, let's say, enough variability. That's a very important thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, the challenge of just using the obvious frameworks that uh, you can use. Let's say in the first iteration, you might use a uh, weighted average approach that you, you just see that it doesn't simply work. And we knew that, of course. Uh, so we we had brainstormed enough in order to be able to, uh, to see that grouping and clustering and building all this framework that we discussed would, would resolve this and overcome these challenges. So these were the main two ones. Great, thank you. Um, next question, uh, and I'll pose this uh, to either of you, uh, because it's probably uh, each of you has um, your kind of opinion here, or not opinion, but how, how you look at it. But how can how can someone improve their viewability score if they have a low score in viewability, just in general? I can respond to that. So, uh, you know, improving scores in general is a process of uh, that requires uh, some kind of iteration and going back and forth. So what we usually uh, do is we're trying to see if there are any, um, let's say, sources that, that can uh, let's say, produce lower quality inventory, uh, essentially trying to group the traffic, don't see the data holistically uh, at the publisher level, but just trying to see where a publisher can suffer. So it might be certain sources, even 
detectable in RCXT that might behave uh, bad. And that's even more, let's say, clear, let's say in the case of um, uh, placements that are not placed properly or high refresh rates or things like that that can, you know, uh, can create problems. So uh, definitely a recommendation here is to, to study the data and try to understand where the, you know, the problem comes from by doing segmentation, not just by just looking at it in the big picture. And certainly, if you request the publisher diagnostic report, you know you can you can see what the score is we have on there, and and some suggestions that might help you improve that. Um, you know, at least from from our perspective. Um, next question um, on app ads dot text: um, Do we measure both reseller and direct partners, or direct partners and or I guess is a question. So. Yeah. Yeah. So we basically measure all resellers and direct partners. Uh, we basically look at how many entries there are, the number of accounts there is. Uh, basically, anything to do with as txt document, we look at that. Uh, basically, we have various metrics uh, which kind of show uh, like how like how does a good or a good publisher behave versus how a bad publisher behaves when it comes to HTXT, and that is how we compare. And it comes to direct sellers, resellers, number of entries, number of accounts, all of those. One also one important thing to note here is that we have done extensive research to uh, analyze HTXT information with the full supply path, uh, and we have seen that HTXT uh, by itself is can be gamed as the industry very well knows right and by correlating that with celebration information and starting the supply path you can find patterns that uh things can be gamed you know like uh, the ids and the, the supply path is not followed exactly and stuff like that so we try to approach it from the perspective of uh of potentials for invalid traffic or potential for low quality traffic and we had to go, you know, not only just study what the file says about the direct relationship, but also study, uh, you know, the type of, of sellers and resellers. So essentially both uh, to a lot of detail, including, you know, manually, exp you know, studying the supply paths to find inconsistencies. Okay, great. Thank you for those answers. That was good. Um, next question, um, how did you decide on the methodology for ad density measurement, uh, also known as why did you decide to look at premium pub publishers versus smaller <clears throat> publishers? We tried to look at every publisher. I don't think we, we focused or we, we were biased towards something specific. We tried to understand, first of all, what are the most common density values? And we given some density values, how do this affect uh, user engagement? Uh, for a given category, right? So if you look at apps holistically, maybe you mix up effects and it's not very clear what causes engagement, like multimedia apps, video apps will have higher engagement, obviously. But um, uh, let's say uh, among all the apps for a certain category, we expect publishers to have the same behavior for the same type of content, right? Uh, sorry, I, I mean users. So by looking at various publishers like top, mid, low tier publishers and studying their behavior, we were able to find what is the, mo the most common value that, that behaves better or the most predictive, as we call it, data science, right? So we're talking about predictive parts of certain values here. And that's, that's kind of a framework that we followed in order to uh, come up with the uh, distribution that we discussed earlier that assigns the best scores to the most, you know, the best performing. So these are not necessarily big publisher scores. This can be also found in small publishers. But the main notion here is that they uh, they give a good balance for the size of the publisher. They give you a good balance between performance and engagement. Okay, Melvin, you have anything else you want to add there? No, I think Agnes covered pretty much everything. Okay, great. All right, next question. We have just a couple more and then we'll wrap up. Um, and I, I can answer this question. Uh, really quickly, but what countries and categories do these rankings support? Um, on the rankings for, in terms of countries, we can do by by um, geography, so North America, uh, EMEA, 
LATAM and APAC, and then we can do country level. And on CTV, we support 60 plus countries. And on mobile, we uh, 230 plus countries on both of those. In terms of IAB categories, for mo mobile, we support, um, like we mentioned before, all of the IAB categories specifically. And then CTV in the respective Roku and Fire TV, we support their categories that they have inside of their platforms. Um, there's, there's not a standard between those two. So you can see that the 200 different metrics um, and indexes that we can do pivot across you know, the different platforms, um, of course, CTV and mobile, and then across the platforms like Apple, uh, App Store, Google Play, and then CTV, Roku, and Fire TV, and then countries. Uh, so there's ways to kind of look at the different areas and regions of the data, um, which is really helpful for people, especially um, in in kind of developing areas, uh, you know, like uh, APAC in terms of, of CTV and, and certainly Latin America. Okay, um, one last question. Um, is it possible for new matrix to be added in the future as the marketplace changes? Aglas, I'll throw that over to you. Yeah, so if I if I had correctly, new metrics to be added, right? Yeah, is it possible? Would, would you ever add kind of new? Yeah, yeah definitely the framework can, can be extended to any kind of metrics. I think that was baked in the design of the, of the publisher indexes is adaptability. There is nothing like, for example, that's very uh, that's constrained on using ad density on CTV versus mobile or, or not using, let's say, permissions in one or the other. Um, so that's one. The second thing is, we I think the way we should approach that is as the ecosystem evolves, our objective is to study predictability and predictive power of certain metrics. And if, let's say, in the future we find that um, maybe, uh, let's say, the, the type of entries in a privacy policy document are very predictive of uh, how the publisher behaves, then we will just use that. So it's it's more of a methodology that we use to to study what is informative versus what not. And then just uh, throw it in the framework and then the framework will produce the rankings. Got it. Well, um, I, I, I noticed uh, we had a couple of uh, other questions come in, but we're, we're kind of over our time um, for the 45 minutes. We will answer those questions um, directly to folks um, that have asked those, so stay tuned for those. Again, this has been recorded and we will send out a link to everybody in the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, and uh, you'll be able to review this or share this with your uh, with any of your colleagues. Again, you can go to pixelate.com slash rankings to see the rankings. Um, you can also click on um, any of the publishers in either the CTV or mobile and see the insights um, as well as more details around the scores. We do encourage you to create an account if you don't have one to see more details. Um, there's also the methodology um, is published on our website as well. And you can get to that through uh, either the resources menu or in that once you're inside of uh, the media ratings terminal, there's a link on the left hand um, uh, uh, bar that will give you a link to this methodology. I appreciate everybody attending today. Uh, thank you, Melwin. Thank you, Agalos, for the good information. Um, we appreciate everybody that's been able to uh, join us and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thank <music> you.